Hi, it's Evan Kerstell here with Avira Health. Uh, nice to have you all with us today. I'm in the Boston area and one of the co-founders of Avira Health and look forward to a pretty fascinating session on the science of skin and wearables. Thanks to the folks at healthmanagement.org. There are 40,000 plus membership driven stakeholder community promoting management, leadership, and best practices in the healthcare space uh, led by multidisciplinary thinking and collaboration. So thanks for having us here today. Uh, this webinar is sponsored by our friends at 3M Healthcare, and it should be a really great discussion uh, for anyone interested in wearable technology in particular and looking to commercialize a wearable device. Uh, it used to be that you know, it used to be said that you were within 15 feet or so of any 3M product at any given time, like a sticky note or one of the myriad of 3M products. And with wearable technologies, you'll be within a few nanometers of a 3M product. So uh, it should be a fascinating discussion uh, on the science. And of course, with the pandemic, there's never been a more important time for the wearable medical device industry. I was actually first introduced to the 3M healthcare team at CES in January, which frankly feels like a lifetime ago. And um, fast forward to now, um, and we're seeing this Cambrian kind of explosion of wearable technologies and devices and related application applications. So look forward to this update from 3M. We'll start with our first panel and, and, and guest, a very distinguished member of the 3M team, uh, Audrey Sherman, who devoted her professional career to science at 3M. She's a division scientist in the medical space where she creates new technologies for the next wave of, of cutting edge products. And she's, um, in addition to being a very determined and skilled scientist, she helps the organization pursue business and opportunities and address the challenges of taking technologies to market. She's also um, uh, as importantly uh, uh, a champion of girls and women in STEM. And here's a fun fact, she holds 140 plus patents um, from uh, her, her start in the science arena and uh, she gave 3M their 100,000 sorry, 100 million patent in 2014. So Audrey, really great to see you here today. Um, we're gonna jump into your presentation momentarily, but just to, to kick things off, how do you keep innovating uh, and learning in a space like uh, medical tapes and adhesives, an area one would imagine is pretty well known and, and understood these days? Thanks, Evan. Say, uh, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, how do you keep innovating is, uh, is a question I get asked a lot. But, you know, it's really about bringing your experiences that are unique to you into new areas. And so your experiences, whether they're learning directly or learning indirectly, it's, it's all about just keep piling more and more and more onto the story and growing it uh, newer and newer. So well, speaking you. of newer and newer, I can't wait to learn a bit about this landscape and your unique perspective. So take it away. Yes, thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Evan. And I'm gonna share my screen here and uh, we'll get going. Um, What's really interesting about wearable devices and the, and the science of skin is it, it really boils down to we are going, we, when I say we, I really mean we, this is all about us now. Wearables, when it comes to wearables, you're talking about you and I. And uh, there's a lot of challenges attaching these devices to skin because we're still trying to get clinically relevant data 
But now we're trying to collect this data over hours to days to weeks. And over that time period, skin is still, we still have to remember that skin is a dynamic surface. We're not talking anymore about it, sticking something on your wall or sticking something on a piece of paper or, or a box uh, to ship it. This now is a dynamic surface. So a few things uh, about 3M's design mission. First of all, we're human centered um, because it's all about us, like I said. And we're also focused then on function and experience together. And I can't uh, emphasize as much about that, that whole patient experience um, as you'll see here, as I go through through my my slides here, it's just really interesting. Wearables are becoming the thing, but they still are the medical thing. And so, whether you can tell which wearable I'm wearing is turns out to be a really personal thing to to myself and to patients. And so, what? What, what ends up happening, you know, wearable devices, they really are very, very intimate, super intimate. They're going to be a part of you now. They're going to be a part of your uh, diagnostic course. They're going to be part of your life now and help you to become healthier. And so there's a lot that goes into that um, about the surfaces, that these wearable devices have to come in contact with. Um, I'm showing here a blowout of just a typical wearable device. And, and what you'll see here are there's going, there's, there's basically two layers that we are gonna experience. The top layer, the protective layer, not only are we gonna experience it, others are gonna experience it. And then all the way through the stack, down to the adhesive that's right up against your skin that you are really experiencing firsthand. This picture on the right always reminds me of my, first, my husband's first experience with a glucose monitor, doing some construction at his mother's house. And on the way out, she thought that he actually had a little um, part of a table leg stuck on the back of his arm. And she went to pull it off, said, how did you get the table leg cap on the back of your arm? And he said, no, 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 that's my wearable glucose monitor. Well, what I noticed real soon after that is his sleeves got longer and his positioning of that monitor went higher because he didn't really want to be out and about with that uh, showing on the back of his arm all the time, especially if his mother was trying to pull it off. Um, so there's a lot of considerations uh, for designing these devices then. Again, like I had said, you know, the wear time, if we're, if we're going from a day to a week to a few weeks to are we gonna try to go for a month now, what does that risk, what is that, risk that the skin that your body that you're placing underneath this device uh, going to see. Do we have the right adhesives for this, this device application? And that involves if you've got your partners early on, what are some of your design decisions that implied um, how this is going to work, how it's going to feel and um, Basically, you need to take still this holistic approach to, to these devices now. So before we talk adhesives, I want us to get in a little bit more of understanding the complexities uh, of skin. And I'm gonna go through a couple of things here that we've published about the science of skin. You can find a lot of this information on our, on our websites as well. Uh, but to start it off, maybe, I'll just come up here with a, with a couple of questions um, about how knowledgeable we are about skin. Um, 
these are pretty innocuous questions here. You know, many of us, when I first started in this field, I just thought, really, does how much of this matters? You know, how much do I really know about it? Um, but it it was some of it was surprising to me. Most of it maybe not surprising to me. The hydrated people, the amount of dust in your home that is really human skin. So I think of the skin as basically a conveyor belt. It's moving from the inside to the outside of your body and then it drops off at the end here. That has a lot of implications when you're trying to adhere to something that's dynamic and moving in that fashion. So again, how do we think about our skin. I mean, it is our largest organ. It's elastic. It's really our interface to the world. It protects us from the outside world too. It's our sense of touch. So not only that, we rely on this. It's actually one of our five senses. It's self-repairing, which is wonderful until that breaks down. And it also is responsible for regulating our body temperature and our phosphate calcium. So the structure of our skin. Structure of our skin looks like this in that it's a, a number of layers. We start with our stratum corneum, which I said was kind of the end of the conveyor belt. From that layer, things pretty much slough off all the way down through our dermis into the hypodermis. And all throughout this, you have got various structures, hair follicles, nerves, um, all of the regulation and uptake happens here in these below layers. One of the important regulation and uptake is moisture. And, uh, Whereas our skin is a wonderful barrier for us from moisture from the outside, it's also where our perspiration and our uh, moisture comes from underneath our skin cells and is required to escape. It's actually required to escape. So when you think about combining an electronic device with this basically moisture path that is supposed to happen, uh, there's a huge congruency there. Most electronics devices and water, they just don't mix. Um, nobody wants to drop their cell phone anywhere near water. Uh, now we're going to be taking very sophisticated devices and attaching them to our skin, which is constantly evolving moisture. And you may think that that's okay. We know how to stop that moisture. But remember, it's critical to the skin to be able to regulate that moisture. So how do we balance the needs of the device and the needs of the skin? And then there's, there's the inevitable aging. Aging reduces skin functionality. Aging reduces pretty much almost most of our functionality in life. We're just simply getting old. So our epidermis is thinning. We increase our, our uh, evaporation rate. We have fewer functional dendritic cells. Our cells don't turn over as fast. Um, and, and the skin gets a little drier then as well. And so these all have implications in who is going to wear your wearable device. Is it going to be the very, very youngest with totally different skin, although frail as can be? Is it going to be the elderly with very, very frail, thin skin uh, as well? So again, taking in mind the, the type, the age of the skin, where you're gonna design your wearable, where you're gonna wear your wearable all come into play. 
And part of the the rest of reducing the skin functionality is some of it helps our wearables, some of it hurts our wearables. We don't have as much collagen synthesis anymore. We don't have as much elastin. The skin is not as elastic when, when it's aged skin. The blood vessels become much more fragile. It's much easier for bruising to occur. Um, and these are things that can impact the perception of your user. Nobody wants to be bruised all the time. Nobody wants to have their skin uh, behave, behave poorly during the wearing session and then after the wearing session as well. Very, very important uh, to the user. So that function and that user experience really come into play here. Again, many factors that can affect this wear time. This picture always reminds me when I see um, rough, contaminated, breathing, uh, low surface energy. This reminds me of a baseball game that my husband attended. Again, he's my kind of uh, internal guinea pig here in my, in my home. Uh, but his device at a sunny, wonderful baseball game disappeared. In the fifth inning, he's in the car driving home to get a new device, which he put on quickly and hastily, but forgot that he had the sunscreen still on. And so the second device quickly failed and fell off. At that time, I get a call at home that says, I'm having a lot of trouble. I, my, I, I lost it at the ball game. I'm at home now. The next one won't stick. I, I'm, I, he, he's really feeling anxious about this. And again, to say, wait, let's think about what's going on here. It's a hot, sweaty day. You're sitting in the stadium. You've got short sleeve shirt on. You're rubbing up against the chairs. Now you've got sunscreen. Let's just take a step back and get things ordered again and get your wearable device back working for you. And so these are things that, that impact these design. These are real life happenings where the, the, the user, now my husband, he understands he left the ball game to go get a new sensor. That shows he knows how important that is in his life he still had the sunscreen on the other arm. That shows he's not thinking that he has a contaminated surface. To him, it was just skin. Um, and so these are the things that we need to, to keep in mind um, because th these are real. Not only is there the materials that we produce on the skin and that we put on the skin, but there's also the microbiology of the skin too. So, so we are not alone. 80% uh, of our bacteria resident in the first five layers. And the rest of the 20%, you know, is down in the biofilms buried deep. So even when you wash your skin, it doesn't take very long till that surface bacteria recolonizes your skin underneath there. And now we need to also take that into consideration as well. We don't want to really disrupt too much of the patient's skin. And the resident bacteria is again, part of that. So if you're going for a long, long, long-term wear, that's almost like wearing your socks for a month straight. Nobody does that. Um, the microbiology is crazy then. So just other things for us to think about. Um, when we get to now to medical adhesives, the history here is, is not very long that we've been adhering things to people. So natural rubber uh, latex adhesives were the first rubber introduced. Probably remember it as the white tape that came in the aluminum tin can. Uh, regular adhesive tape or, or short, is short for rat tape. Um, but the natural rubber latex adhesives where they do a very, very good job, 
they came into uh, protein allergies and have since been pretty much discouraged for skin contact. The acrylate adhesives that were introduced in the 1960s, those are, are considered almost hypoallergenic. There's no skin reaction allergy uh, to those adhesives. They do a great job of holding to the skin. They are very, very modifiable in that they can have high adhesion, they can have adhesion to wet, they can have adhesion to dry skin, and they can um, build adhesion and actually hold devices in place as well. And then there's the, the new kid on the block, which, which is one of my favorites, which is one of my real backgrounds, which is silicone adhesives. You know, acrylate adhesives to the chemist based on carbon. The next element under that periodic table is silicon. So very similar in behavior um, as far as chemical but it couldn't be farther away from behavior as far as the human body is concerned. And that gives us a lot of opportunities to introduce some really out of this world features that, that are here today and that are still coming with silicone adhesives. And so um, how do we, test our adhesives and determine whether our adhesives are even going to be close to working. So there's three measures that we basically take under consideration when we're looking at adhesion. Uh, TAC has to do with when you first touch it. You touch it together, it's either going to feel sticky or the word tacky, or it's going to feel dry. Uh, we wouldn't expect to stick a piece of paper onto our skin. That's going to feel dry. When you touch that little sticky part of the post-it note, it feels sticky, although it may not stick to your body. So that's tack. Adhesion has to do with the bending removal force. So we call that the peel at removal force. And as you can see in that picture, it's actually bent almost backwards like a V. And what's happening also is we are now including in this force, forces from the, the other layers in that laminate. So whereas the tack only took in consideration that first layer, the adhesion now, peel adhesion is taking in consideration all of those layers together. They're all playing a role in this force. Then there's the shear forces. And the shear forces, while not as dependent on the laminate construction and not as dependent on that first initial feeling of tack, they definitely create forces that uh, exist within themselves and the underlying surface. And what's interesting here, I like about this graphic, we're showing it in a kind of a grayish, silverish, silverish color. And we actually test with the ASTM method to stainless steel. But like I like to remind people, there's only one man of steel and he doesn't usually use tape and medicine. He's pretty much impermeable. So steel is not our best substitute for testing uh, when we're testing for skin. It still is serving us well, but it's not perfect. So here's a little bit, uh, a cartoon here of how the various adhesives uh, adhere to skin over time. And what you can see here, I, I, I really like this graph as well. The, the red solid line was that original synthetic rubber. That thing will stick onto you immediately, almost like a duct tape sticks onto everything immediately. But with time, it tends to trail off. The acrylics, when they were designed, they were like, okay, we need to fix what synthetic rubber is. So you can see they went the opposite way. They may not be as sticky right away, but they certainly build their adhesion and can hold through the length of, of time. 
And then new, new kid on the block here is the silicone. And of course you can see we're designing these. We're right down the middle. Um, not too sticky, not too dry, not too high appeal, not too low. And by the way, when you put it on, it stays on. And so we're really starting to influence the skin in some much, much better manner. Uh, but these are all tools that are available uh, in the wearable area. Again, don't forget about function and experience. They have to go together. So one of the other injuries that, one of the injuries that we really look for is called medical adhesive related skin injury. And it really is MARSI, medical adhesive related skin injury. And it takes its form in a lot of areas, whether it be skin stripping or allergic reaction, like I said, with the proteins and the natural rubber or maceration, like uh, sitting in the tub way too long. You've, you, you, you're not allowing that skin to let that moisture leave. Um, tension injuries, blisters, folliculitis, there's many injuries that can happen when your skin to adhesive attachment is really uh, causing problem with that substrate. And that substrate, don't forget, it's you and I, it's, it's we. Uh, there's a lot of different factors that come into play with this uh, Marcy as well, whether it be just like we said, the extremes of aging, your choice of adhesives, or even immunosuppression, uh, a sunburn can change it. A sunscreen can change it. And then of course, even underlying illness, when you're not well, your skin's not well. Um, so these all need to be part of what we consider as we connect the people, the ideas, these technologies, and how we're gonna design these devices. So at 3M, I'm really, really lucky that I get to run across all kinds of platforms. It really helps me come up with new, new and unique ideas. It really helps me quickly talk to a guy in a non-wovens, a gal in adhesives, and my newest engineer in films and say, hey, what if we did this? Wouldn't this be great? And so 3M uh, is just like the toy ground for scientists. Um, and we're always within a call or two away from somebody that's ready to say, what if? So with that, I will end my session of All About Skin. And I'm hoping that everybody will be very anxious to collaborate. You can learn way more about skin uh, at 3m.com, the science of skin. And you can also go to a findmyadhesive.com. And uh, we have a nice website, just a few questions, and we can get you to write to the right place. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, Audrey. Really uh, fascinating and insightful. Um, I had no idea about the, the range of challenges uh, in this space. Given all the technologies you've had access to and enable for your customers, what's the most surprising use case that you've seen in medical tech? Something that really caught you off guard? Yeah, I, one that, that really caught me off guard is one that would be looking, combining like an, an EKG, the electrodes, only being able to do that wirelessly to your doctor. That would be, you know, now you're just taking, instead of go to the doctor's office, which a lot of us are not able to today, being able to just hold a thing to your chest and your physician is giving you a diagnosis. Now that may not be one today that you're wearing around, but the fact that he can he can see what and hear what he needs to hear when you're not in the room, that one's that that type 
of wearable. It may only be wearable for the two or three minutes when he needed you to wear it, but wow, how, you know, that one is just really blowing my mind. I really want to stick on stethoscope now. That's absolutely. It's, it's almost science fiction, not cutting edge technology. So beam me up, Scotty, for, for yes. that one. <laughs> um, well, thanks so much. And we'll come back uh, to you and the others with additional questions from uh, the audience. And Wonderful. we'll uh, move, move on to our next guest, uh, uh, Thomas Hickey. Uh, Thomas, and I'll do a quick introduction uh, uh, to, to Thomas. He's the a partner and founder of Accelerant Consulting. Uh, he has over 35 years experience in the medical device industry, which makes him older than I am. Um, he successfully launched products, hired, coached, trained, motivated, and managed hundreds of, of distributors and independent sales folks over his career. And he's really an expert at developing innovative strategies and tactics in sales and go-to-market and, and marketing and his you know, vast experience enables him to identify a product or services unique value proposition and, and present that to audiences uh, right up to the C-suite. Uh, most recently, he's launched the podcast MedTech Gurus to help medical device executives stay on top of the industry. And that's really a must listen to podcast. So I encourage you to, to go find that out and listen. So um, welcome, Thomas. Evan, good morning. It's uh, it's great to be here with with everybody this morning, and um, you know through the um, activities at Accelerant and certainly over the last year or so with MedTech Gurus, we're hearing a, a lot about wearables. We're noticing three at least three key areas and trends that uh, wearables are having an impact with. Um, that being the patient themselves, the clinical involvement. And by that, I mean the doctors, the nurses, pharmacists, et cetera. And then there's a medical center impact that we're, we're watching as well. Um, from a patient perspective, and, and Audrey touched on this a little bit, um, patients right now, because of COVID-19 and, and some other things going on in the community, are really reluctant to enter the medical, um, uh, the healthcare delivery system. So anything that can be done remotely, you know, Audrey was talking about, cardiac, which is really, uh, you know, one of the key areas in and around chronic diseases that a wearable can really help. So anything that can be done remotely and easily is enhancing that patient experience. And we're finding the patients are really enthusiastic about this. And the other trend that we have really noticed is wearables have been developing for a while, but the enthusiasm for them over the last 18 months or so has really accelerated because you've got that patient interest and you've got that clinical interest kind of coming together to create a, a, a key market demand and interest in this. From a clinical involvement, the clinicians, what we're hearing from them is they're looking at re, uh, wearables because of uh, patient compliance, right? Because if you can just put something on your skin, your arm, your chest, and, and cover it up and kind of forget it, patients are more likely to do that than trying to hook themselves up to a piece of equipment or having to come in to have that done on a routine basis. So that patient compliance has really been key for the clinicians. One of the other areas that we're seeing that Audrey just touched on is the immediacy of data, right? Because more and more companies are looking at, gee, you know, how can we transport this data via, you know, the cloud and some of the things right directly and almost immediately to that, to that clinician. So that immediacy is really important because if there's going to be an adverse event, the sooner you can get to it, the better that patient outcome is going to be. So by seeing that information, you know, almost beat to beat if it was cardiac or, you know, blood pressure or blood sugar or what have you, getting that right away can really have an impact on the patient's outcome. Um, so, you know, from those aspects, the cl clinicians are really involved in, you know, the ease and usefulness for the patient and for them as a caregiver. And then lastly, you've got to consider the medical center impact, right? So medical centers right now are because of just a lot of stresses, they're interested in reimbursement and return on investment, of course, 
The other thing that you want to consider with the, the medical center impact is the data and the data integrity. You know, so as that information is coming in, you know, the healthcare systems love that information, but we need to make sure it's secure. So that's, that's a big consideration. And then lastly, you know, wearables are really starting to prove their outcomes for all the stakeholders. And I would encourage all of the entrepreneurs, all the product development people, uh, all the marketing people on this call to really think about, you know, uh, identifying and, and uh, quantifying all of those outcomes, because that's going to be really important to you because you want to roll that all up into a value analysis packet because that's gonna help reduce your sales cycle and your um, acceptance cycle with the product. So you wanna demonstrate that you're getting better care management, you're getting uh, a reduction of patient visits and you're getting better patient outcomes. All of that rolls up into that whole reimbursement ROI patient outcome that a lot of our clinicians and medical centers are being um, graded on uh, in today's environment. Um, and then in summary, you know, I'd really encourage, you know, from a, a product design, from a patient interface and clinical outcomes, you know, all those things are key. And what you're really going to want to do is consult really early with 3M because they can really uh, effectively help you manage that process. So, you know, reach out to um, Audrey and her team so you can get involved with them very early on with that design, which will only help you get to a quicker outcome and a quicker commercialization. Well, thanks so much. And that was a really great overview of, of the landscape and the opportunities for OEMs and innovators. Uh, we'll come back to you, Thomas, with some additional questions. Um, let me just quickly introduce the uh, last member of the panel here, uh, Irma Rastagaiva, who is a Boston-based consultant and storytelling coach at the intersection of health, uh, technology, and patient experience. She's among the top 30 women in tech and is recognized as an influencer in digital health and health tech. IoT and related topics and following a 20 year career in product development, consulting and technology management at companies like IBM and Google and others, Irma now combines her deep technical expertise with patient advocacy and community engagement on social media and beyond, as well as the uh, chief digital storyteller at Vera Health. So welcome Irma. Thank you, Evan. So glad to be on the panel with uh, Audrey and Thomas and yourself, Evan. Yeah, you, you've heard uh, a couple of the panelists already. What's your perspective, maybe from a patient standpoint, on some of the technologies and innovations that we've seen so far? Um, well, absolutely. It was such a great uh, overview of uh, from Audrey um, on the science of skin and what makes variable devices uh, quite difficult to design uh, because uh, unlike a lot of other medical technologies, uh, uh, wearables have to interact and they interact very closely with the skin, which is so dynamic. And um, from a patient perspective, uh, I think uh, we see now the revolution of wearables that can enable uh, a variety of um, uh, really uh, ways to improve patient care from a patient and caregiver standpoint. So with remote patient monitoring, I mean, we talk about chronic diseases and how uh, one in six Americans um, has um, at least two chronic diseases. Um, and it's uh, becoming increasingly, increasingly difficult to um, manage these uh, at scale. So I see patients uh, really being empowered with um, an opportunity to gather a lot of their own data for their own um, understanding of their condition, but also to provide uh, physicians with that actionable data. Um, that for things like cardiovascular disease and you know, in terms of blood pressure monitoring or monitoring of um, you know, in diabetes monitoring of sugar levels, it's really about continuous monitoring. It's not just uh, um, kind of some points in time where you get those measurements, it's continuous monitoring of uh, how patient um, 
uh, does in the various settings, including in the home setting where most of uh, people, you know, spend their time at work and, and at home. So I really see a great opportunity um, to uh, empower patients. And then um, especially with the high risk of exposure to the coronavirus during the pandemic, you know, as we know, many hospitals uh, were mandated to close for months. Um, and then also regular healthcare has been disrupted for um, really uh, many, many people. So wearables allow patients to um, track their vitals and also to be able to um, connect with their providers through telehealth, for example, and be, be able to um, talk about their, um, you know, their health concerns without having to be in the, in the office. And then they can have some of these readings that the doctors would be doing, you know, hands-on in the, in the office setting. Um, and then I see that also as um, uh, wearables could empower patients to move from, um, you know, big data, which we hear a lot about, to more individually actionable small data. Um, and then we can, you know, talk more about um, that further on. Um, including great points. The yeah, R really great points. And I, I'd love to drill down in, into some of those. Um, let's look at some of the questions from the audience and, uh, and see if we can not answer some of the uh, audience's questions. Maybe we'll start with, um, with Audrey. What are some of the gaps in the types of wearable devices that are available today? And um, what emerging devices do you see filling those gaps? Yeah, great question. So, so some of the gaps that I see today are focused along the length of time that the the wearable device needs to function and stay in contact with the skin. So uh, uh, we're getting more and more devices that, want, that are measuring more and more vitals. And just like Irma said, this, this continuous monitoring is so important to the diagnosis and treatment as well that you know, if you if you asked your physician, how long would you like your patient to wear this wearable? My gosh, he may come up with, well, always, you know, we're almost getting to the to the point of an implantable pacemaker. It's always there. It's always on. But this now is on the outside of the skin. So we have these these forces that are going against each other, the conveyor belt of the skin turning over. It's actually a growing, shedding thing with this need to have a long-term wear. Could we come up with uh, a 45-day or longer wearable device? What would that look like? What does the skin, how does the skin respond to that? So it's not implanted, but it's basically planted. Uh, so I think those are some of the trends that are coming up much longer wear. Yeah, interesting. I remember, remember trying a wearable, uh, a wearable device a few years ago and it turned my skin purple, which wasn't a really uh, desirable side effect. What's, you know, fast forwarding, I think we've come a long way over the last years, but what is the prevalence of uh, injury to skin, you know, medical adhesive related uh, injury? Yeah, so, so Marcy actually, if, if, you, if you categorize that whole treatment from bad selection of adhesive all the way to you didn't know, you know, um, you, you turned red or you turned purple. I mean, that's something your skin is telling you. It actually is around 55% of the time. Wow. Um, so these adverse events, some of them may, be, may go away on their own some of them may actually lead to needing treatment to treat that, that skin at injury. Yeah, and I imagine, um, you know, as we age, uh, you know, our skin becomes more fragile. Uh, how do you deal with aging and, and wearable devices? And of course the need for aging in place means um, even more remote patient monitoring via wearable devices. Um, how do you deal with it, that challenge when it comes to uh, adhesives and tapes? 
Yeah, so so that gentle, gentle skin needs a really gentle, gentle adhesive. And so that's where the the new silicones are really starting to to perform now. It's it's so interesting that it's a uh, it's easy, like I said, for the chemists to synthesize around it, but it's something totally unique that that the that the human body uh, doesn't even respond to. So silicone chemistry in pressure sensitive adhesives can be it is very breathable adhesive. It's uh, actually waterproof, water resistant, um, and it actually doesn't adhere to peeling off dead skin, shedding things, uh, it, you know, because it's easily comes off and you can reposition it as well, all painlessly. So when I think about adhesives that don't cause pain upon removal, to me, that means it's not really disturbing the skin upon removal. And I think that when we move forward to not disturbing the skin while we're attached, now we're gonna get somewhere. That's what we really need to do. How do you attach, but then you don't disturb? And the silicones are really shining in that area. That's fascinating. So at 3M, you have a, quite a, a range of technologies. Does 3M really dominate this landscape? Are there other companies you know, developing tapes and adhesives and what, you know, how do you stay on top of, of, of new innovation and tech and investment in this space? It's, uh, it's quite a dynamic one. Yeah. So there, I mean, certainly there are competitors that, that play in the same areas as we do, but when I show all our technology, the 46 platforms that we play in, you'd be very hard pressed to find a company that plays in all of those. And so what is very interesting, I mean, I worked on pavement marking tapes, okay? So the skips and the stripes on the highway. And highways are very much, in my mind anyway, like our skin. They can be rough, they can be wet, they can be old, they can be new, they can have damage done to them. So when you think about where do you get your new ideas, I can look over to what our guys have done to the road and say, Gal, how did you guys solve this problem on a highway? And then bring that back in. I think our breadth of technology gives us a huge advantage uh, from competitors that are just trying to learn day to day about what they're doing now. Whereas we've got this whole breadth of what we've done that is totally unrelated, but you'll see that a lot of times innovation crops up from something that was totally unrelated. Uh, that's the inspiration. The need is there, but where are you gonna get the inspiration? That's what I think you'll find at 3M. That's fascinating. And of course, this is a global industry. We're one humanity. So building devices for literally potentially billions is, uh, is pretty exciting as well. Thomas, uh, just to shift a question to you on the business side, we've seen this tsunami of devices, some fail, some succeed. You, you know, what, what does the ideal go to market look like? And how does a company, how does an OEM develop a product successfully launch it, introduce it, and, and get traction. Yeah, and, and Evan, thank you for that. And it's become even more complex uh, in, in the recent history because the hospitals have been so overwhelmed. And, and a lot of companies, big companies, small companies, what have you, trying to get access to the clinicians right now because many of the communities are restricted. So it's very difficult. And I mentioned the, the value analysis packet. So if you're ready to launch a new technology, one of the reoccurring themes we hear at Accelerant and, and actually on my podcast, MedTech Gurus, is that getting your, your information all lined up early and having a very complete set with your outcome data, you know, your patient response, 
you know, consulting with somebody like Audrey at 3M to make sure there's no adverse reactions to skin, having all those components put together. So when you finally get the attention of a caregiver or a decision maker, they don't have to go look for information. It's all right there in one, in one file that they can look at and review because the more they have to start to query uh, you and your company, that's just gonna prolong the sales cycle and or they might lose interest because another uh, emergency has come up. So getting all your groundwork done early, making sure all your data is aligned, um, making sure you've consulted with somebody like 3M to make sure your, your, your background, your research, all your product information is as pristine as you can make it, just helps in that process. But it's not easy, right? So it takes perseverance and um, you know, your expectation should be a, a long sales cycle, make sure your investors are, are well aware of that and, and but follow it through, follow up, follow up, follow up, and continue to add to, you know, your information packet to help those decision makers. Yeah, really useful advice. And I encourage folks to reach out to you on social media where Irma and I are, are, are quite active. And shifting a, 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 maybe one of the last qu final questions to Irma at Avira Health, um, on a low note, perhaps we're in the midst of uh, second or third wave, I'm not sure which wave we're in, but it's, it's, it's really difficult. Um, what does wearable technology offer us in terms of perhaps prevention and early detection? We've seen some early innovation at the NBA bubble with things like the Aura Ring or with the Apple Watch and the new blood oxygen uh, sensor that's built in, but this is really the tip of the wave. What are, do we have potentially to, to help us over the next weeks, months, or even years? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, to state the obvious, in a short period of time, COVID-19 has altered our individual and collective behavior, changing both healthcare and workplaces, perhaps permanently. Now, technology offers tools to meet these new challenges. Um, good population health approaches and personal hygiene practices like wearing face masks and hand washing go a long way towards the slow of the spread of the pandemic and flattening that curve. But beyond these measures, technology can be a powerful ally. New research shows that there is promise in wearables ability to detect early coronavirus symptoms. Back in 2017, Stanford Medicine um, had uh, research results demonstrating that health data collected from wearables can help detect uh, infectious illness uh, days before any of noticeable symptoms emerge. And recently Stanford Medicine had um, partnered with Fitbit and Scripps Research to launch a new effort aiming to detect early signs of viral infections through data from smartwatches and other wearable devices. Um, because wearables, including smartwatches that I think many people now wear, um, because wearables make hundreds of thousands of measurements per day, they make for really powerful monitoring devices. Um, we know that when a human body uh, fights off an infection, there are some signs, including rise in skin temperature and elevated heart rate. Um, by continuously measuring these, wearable devices could help alert us well before he any humanly perceptible symptoms occur. This technology combined with smart algorithms could not only warn an individual of an onset of an infection, but could also be used at the population level to track contact, contacts and potential infection transmission communities. Um, that's helping us curb the spread of viral infections such as SARS-CoV-2. Um, further on to diagnostic and testing using wearable uh, devices and microfluidics. Um, obviously the global scale of the COVID-19 pandemic COVID-19 pandemic brought the need for scalable coronavirus testing and other COVID-19 related solutions into sharp focus. Um, so um, we uh, didn't touch on microfluidics yet. It's kind of a re uh, related discipline. Um, so we're able to um, do point of care diagnostics with microfluidics that make lab on a chip technology possible. Um, so um, that's something that could offer us testing and offer specific answers um, and actionable insights without having to go in office for, uh, for a visit. And then these also could be used in um, antibody testing, which could 
shows at a population level, uh, which people have already had the COVID-19 infection and how pervasive it is in, in, in our communities. Um, so- Well, thanks yeah. so much. Well, it's, it's, it's great to see that the combination of wearable technologies with um, very promising vaccines on the horizons with new therapeutics might just converge into this, uh, you know, uh, bright light at the end of the, the, this very dark tunnel. So on that positive note, uh, we're at the bottom of the hour, and I'd like to thank our guests, uh, Audrey, Irma, and Thomas, as well as healthmanagement.org, and of course, 3M, for putting together, you know, this really interesting panel, and I'd encourage people to uh, reach out to us all on social media, mm -hmm. on LinkedIn, Twitter, and to continue the questions, the conversation mm -hmm. as we move forward. So thanks, everyone, and uh, stay safe. Thank you.